Andrew Barber's diverse 30 year career in the path of horticulture industry has led him to director of production here at Connor Nurseries. His background in plant propagation combined with landscape design construction gives him a unique perspective and to what this growing industry needs for our valuable customers. So Andrew's gonna talk about some pest problems. Thank you. What the yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the, the walk thing. And is it Anne that won the Falco? There's about 100 acres of trees that need to be pruned. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna break those Falcos in right after this. That's what the real happy hour is. Yeah. Okay, good, all right. Um, so, Everyone kind of knows a little bit about the history of Connor Nurseries. It's uh, since 1906, and you can imagine, um, you know, over over the decades, pests and, and diseases have changed, uh, different uh, infestations. And way back when, there was a really really bad grasshopper infestation that we had on one of the crops. So it actually took a lever action 30/30 uh, to to get that. So. My, my talk today is about don't bug me, and it's a little bit of a play on words. Um, I, uh, being a plant propagator, being a grower, being into uh, production planning, I've grown over my career millions of native seedlings. I've done design work. Um, but really, the, the one thread that, that goes through everything is our, basically, is, this, is a plant going to be sustainable in the landscape? Um, a lot of different factors uh, on how to make it sustainable uh, and, and, and ensure that it's success uh, in the landscape. A lot of it is to do with pests and diseases. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of a high level view of what we do in production here. I kind of want to relate this a little bit to maybe um, uh, usable information that, that uh, designers and, and installers can use. Um, we use integrated pest management. Um, we do s scouting. so. Again, kind of what Ted was saying before with insects, we don't want to just go out and, you know, have the place glowing at night with chemical application. In fact, we're, we're, we've reduced our chemical um, applications probably by about 25 to 30 percent in the last five to six years. Um, in our gutter connect greenhouse where we grow oh, half a million um, one gallon perennials uh, per turn, um, we rarely use chemicals anymore. We use uh, a biocontrol. So basically it's uh, insect on insect. So we have, um, we release predatory insects that will actually go and hunt down um, harmful insects. And when you get out a hand, le hand lens and you, and you look at the, you know, your leaf and it is almost like a little Jurassic Park thing happening there. You have the T-Rexes, you know, hunting and, and uh, generally the, the predatory insects that we release um, for a quick reference when you look at a leaf uh, they're usually the quick moving fast ones so a little bit we, we out in in nature uh, there are um, predatory insects that are out there that will help uh, control some of the the uh, harmful insects some of the invasive species so uh, cultural practices it, it all go boils down to you know, airflow Overwatering, underwatering, um, how the plants are, are uh, set out, how they're how they're spaced, different things like that. Physical, again, more with the, the layout. Also, uh, genetic, choosing the, the the proper crop, kind of what Ted was talking about before, with the, with the proper settings. Um, if 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 you need, if if plants are going to be exposed to high winds, things like that, it all goes to uh, their success and. Uh, their ability to, re just, just like you and I, our, our abilities to uh, uh, remain healthy and fight off pests and diseases within our own self, the plants are going to be there. So if we're living a healthy lifestyle in, the, in a great area, similar to plants, we're going to be able to, uh, to uh, get away from diseases. Um, and then, you know, chemical. Now, here's another thing. Um, can anybody name this type of damage? Yeah, there we go. You know, usually, usually it's like a... A, a bunch of blank stares and someone says machinery damage and I'm like no it's bug guy humor so this is caterpillar damage so a little play on words because if you all can remember last summer it seems like a, a blur because it went by so quickly we had a record year for gypsy moth so uh, my wife and I love to hook up our camper and take our dogs camping in provincial parks and some of the parks they were literally just raining um, gypsy moth caterpillars all over the place. Even before um, 
booking these these parks, uh, it would have a warning right on there. You know, defoliated trees and insects falling and all this kind of thing. And usually that can happen in about a 10-year cycle. Um, what that means to you, uh, they do certain municipalities will do um, uh, a BTK uh, biological spray from uh, in an aerial um, application, and it's non-toxic to humans. We I think we do. Brad can back me up on this. I think we do have uh, applications that you homeowners can can use for that. Basically, banding trees so that they, the caterpillars can't migrate and, and walk up um, the, the, the neighboring trunks. Um, we have Scott uh, Ferris from our new market location, the general manager there. It's a fairly new location. It's directly beside a big, big wood lot. And we planted, you know, some trees in the field, and all of a sudden it was like a, a, bu a buffet bell went off. You know, they moved out of the wood lot and they went over. So it can happen literally like that overnight where there's no infestation to trees being defoliated. You can actually hear them eating. Um, we had some fields here with even oak. They seem to love the oak and totally defoliated, but by the time fall came around, everything was butted out and, and back in full leaf. So yeah, it, it's definitely something that generally doesn't kill a tree, but, but cosmetically it's, it's, it's unpleasant. Um, so what we can do at this point, uh, you can get out there if, you, if your customers or clients are concerned, if any of you, any of you have uh, maintenance contracts, uh, removal of the, um, at the top left there, you can see some of the adults and some of the egg masses Removal of those egg masses off the stem is actually one of the most effective ways to uh, to treat them and to lower the populations. I mean, you're probably not going to scale a you know 60 foot tree to get up to the top and start pulling them off, but have your crews get out there and look. And that's maybe something added that you can you can either market or do for your customers that you know gypsy gypsy moth egg mass removal to help help with that. Um, again. You usually see them crawling up the uh, the stems. It's a little bit different later on. I'll show you a slide. E there are tent ca eastern tent caterpillars, which a lot of people right away thought, oh, this is an eastern tent caterpillar, but they are the gypsy moth caterpillars. So again, hopefully we don't go through that that uh, same sort of a, a deal this year, but um, we've had, I wouldn't say an overly cold winter, so I would say that the uh, the population is going to be strong again. Um, this is something kind of new coming that you might want to have on your radar. If you've read, uh, has anybody ever read anything about the spotted lanternfly? Yeah, at the back there, okay. It's, it, it technically isn't here yet. It, it could affect some of the uh, vineyards, some of the, the grape. I think that's a little bit more um, what they like to snack on. Um, again, with the world being sort of a, a global uh, shipping where you can get things within days across the, the planet on skids you know they 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 they, press, they treat wood now after after the Asian longhorn issues and everything like that but these little guys love to hitch rides and that's how our invasive species come um, we don't like what Ted was talking about uh, a little bit earlier on and I think you mentioned the biodiversity type um, the nursery is surrounded. We have the Lake Medad, which is a, a very sensitive area. Uh, Swampland um, helps uh, filter a lot of the surrounding uh, watershed. And it was a heavy, heavy woodlot of, of uh, ash. So when the em emerald ash bore went through several years ago, you can see right through to the back and you could never see that before. Um, we actually got involved with uh, a species at risk program and because as I think someone else touched upon that when uh, a woodlot isn't biodiverse and everything disappears then the under understory trees uh, will start to die off and then along with that any species that that you know that's their their habitat can either die off or move away now there was I, I can never remember the name there was an endangered species on the list in specifically this water down area and leak me data of a turtle and um, it, its population was on decline because of the woodlot so we got involved and we ended up making that woodlot a more biodiverse woodlot and we planted uh, I can't remember how many hundreds of different uh, species of native plants and trees and shrubs and ground covers in, in there and we actually created 
um, with some of the ash, log areas with gravel, which would entice the turtle population to come back and, and allow them to have nesting grounds. So if anybody ever gets into like a large type of woodlot production or uh, uh, design, kind of keep that in mind too, where you could add in places for nesting for turtles and different things and d different amphibious creatures. And it, it will, will bring them back. And actually one of our sales staff um, came and told me that uh, they did see one of the turtles back there now. So it's kind of a win-win situation. Um, fortunately, some of the, uh, the ash that had fallen actually got uh, made into lumber and, and live edge furniture, things like that. So, um, you know, we want it to fall and, and rot, but that was just way too much. Uh, so yeah, so keep your eye out for, for lanternfly. It hasn't officially come across the border yet, th but again, in a couple of years, this might be one of those issues. It, uh, it, it, it will feed on, on plants. You can see the ag mass at the top, what that looks like, but again, kind of more of towards the, uh, the, the vineyard type grape industry. Um, what I like to say is, yeah, th these lectures and, and, and any opportunity you have to learn. I mean, when I was learning, um, you know, the Durr, Durr book was, was my favorite uh, publication to look at. Um, it was kind of before you could really just punch up, bring up Google and punch things in. And, and so you kind of had to really search for your information. Well, technology is amazing. Like I went from, you know, now carrying a cell phone where I can control our, our uh, um, greenhouse climate anywhere in the world to uh, years ago when I was landscaping, I had uh, a, a new thing called a pager that would let me know that my answering machine at home was a customer had just called it and I could go to a stop at a, a phone booth and then put, hold my pager up. And I was like, this is great. This is technology. So uh, one, of, one of the new things, um, so this has uh, been out uh, a number of years now, I think somewhere back in like 2015 or 16. Uh, David Chung was, uh, Chung was a, uh, a University of um, Guelph student and Jennifer Llewellyn, who is a um, Omafra uh, of official kind of uh, agent, they came up and they, he, he was an entomologist, he loved bugs, he took literally, you know, tens of thousands of high-res pictures of bugs and, and identified them as, uh, for his uh, doctrine, and, and they developed this, this free app, and you can get it for iOS and Android, and I suggest that you, you download it if you haven't. Go find this app, download it, it's an amazing tool. Yeah, most people now have their cell or have their cell phones on them, smartphones. You can uh, plug in some of the characteristics of a pest if you're uncertain. It'll tell you if it's it's a harmful one, if it's a beneficial pest or a beneficial insect, and uh, it really helps when you have your clients and you just don't know, and they're asking you, you know, these I've seen all these bugs out around the pool area. What are they? And you don't know. Well, you can go up and and figure it out. So good little resource there that uh, if you don't already have it. Definitely uh, download that. A couple of things, I'm, I'm just going to kind of give you a, a few things that I hear a lot of questions about. And some of the pests and diseases are kind of not really identified correctly. And woolly aphid is one. I'll show you another slide of powdery mildew. And from a distance, woolly aphid looks like a powder. And a lot of people, will, well, especially on some of the phagus, um, and they just love to feed. Uh, generally, when you're looking and scouting for insects, it's, you know, I, I, won't, I won't assume that most people know that, but insects usually like to get underneath and hide on underneath. So sometimes you have to flip the le leaf up and, and really take a look. Um, from the surface, it may look like they're perfectly clean, but you get down in there and you start looking along the stem and in there, they, they tend to, to hide underneath and shelter themselves and feed from, from there. So the woolly aphids one that usually gets misidentified, not even as an insect, but more of a, a, a disease, a, a fungus. So check that out. Um, I'll show you at the end of the slide. I suggest, along with downloading your, your, your app, um, carry around a little hand lens in your pocket. Awesome thing, we usually have, uh, most of the growers will have them uh, on a little lanyard and it really helps. You can identify a lot of stuff. If you take a white piece of paper, shake a leaf over it, see what falls off and then put your hand lens on it. So it's a good way to, to go out and scout. Um, again, another thing that you may have heard, everyone's heard about this in the, in the news or read articles about the box tree moth, I'm assuming. So we were over on a research trip a few uh, years ago 
and we were over in uh, Holland and Germany visiting uh, some some suppliers and and checking things out, some trade shows. And back then, the the big thing was um, boxwood uh, blight, and uh, how that was going to devastate. And it was in Europe at the time. It was devastating uh, basically all the boxwood crops. So there's there's a blight, and then there's a virus, and the the virus you can tell usually on the stem i don't have a picture of it up here unfortunately there's a you know long uh dark masses of of just basically a, like almost like a canker on the stem and we've had a little bit of that here um it's been fairly contained it was caught early on so a lot of crops that uh, were imported from europe never made it over here uh, a lot of growers uh, over in europe just turned away from boxwood for a short period of time until they uh, got some uh, chemical treatment and were able to uh, figure out uh, the, the, the issue and, and, and get it culturally under control. But now the box tree moth on the heels of the um, uh, virus and the blight, it, it, it's a little bit deceiving. So we've heard a lot about it in, in, um, in the media and there's probably been some articles, especially in Toronto. It, it was found in uh, originally in a, a small neighborhood around the airport in Etobicoke, and they believe that it did come in on some sort of shipping container or crate, and it kind of exited the airport grounds and, and just kind of found a place to, to kind of feed and, and overwinter in those small neighborhoods. We were, I'm also on the, the Board of Landscape Ontario, the Provincial Board, and also the, the Growers Board. And so we spent quite a bit of time and effort and money into trying to make sure that this didn't become an issue for, for our boxwood crops. And there were traps, box tree moth traps, pheromone traps, set from basically one end of uh, Ontario to the next. Um, and it really isn't spreading. Um, it is fairly contained. There are, were some little spots here and there. Um, the CFIA has has regulations in place when, when exporting and importing boxwood to monitor for this. We monitor for this, uh, and we also have pheromone traps set up, and we have not found it at the nursery. But it, it's definitely something to be aware of, but it's also nothing to really be too... I mean, you need to be aware of it, but you can see the picture down at the bottom. So another great resource is the la actual Landscape Ontario uh, website. Go on there, and there's a lot of different articles. Um, this pick I took right off of there. So you can see on the left, you can see some of the box tree moth damage. You can see on the right, that's the same hedge later on that summer. And after the, the um, basically it's a small caterpillar, like you see in the bottom left there, has done its feeding, it really just skeletonizes the leaf, uh, similar to what we saw with the gypsy moth and totally defoliating uh, uh, something the boxwood with deep watering and they actually have a, a um, cultural practice and, and how to prevent or how to re rejuvenate boxwood if it has been hit with this and you can see how it ha it has come back so by all means if you get into a landscape job or you're quoting and, and you get in there and someone says you know I need need my head ripped out because it's dead well why is it dead <laughs> and is it actually dead so the stems and the root system were fine on this. It's just it was just defoliated. Now you can also say uh, when I talked a little bit about uh, pests and diseases being misdiagnosed, that right there could be there could be a street sidewalk, and that's where Mrs. Jones, Mr. Smith, you know, Ed, the neighbor, all come in the morning with their standard poodles, and you know they they love to pee on the hedge. <laughs> So that's another issue. It could be that, uh, you know, landscaper XYZ company comes and pushes snow up against this that's heavily salt laden and it's, it's burnt the hedge. So you really need to do sort of your little CSI investigation and make sure what you're diagnosing is correct because there's multiple things that, that can cause that. Um, but definitely box tree moth. It's something to be aware of. I wouldn't say that it's it would prevent me from using boxwood in a design. Um, but like everything else, the media kind of hypes certain things up, but they, you know, don't get the full picture of the whole science behind it. Um, one of the more common issues 
especially in some of the tropical plants that you might see around your patios or pool uh, edges, um, quite a often in annual and uh, vegetable gardens, um, are, well, two spotted spider mites, but there's, there's oh, so many different types of spider mite out there, and they're all very common. Generally, like a hot, dry um, area, they tend to, when you do some plantings around a uh, warm, hot concrete, they love that, that heat coming up from the concrete and will be on the leaves. So again, try to diagnose it. You'll look at the leaf. If you see that it's a sucking, they, they love to get in there and they just they, they suck the tissue. So you almost get a little bit uh, of a, uh, a hazing on the leaf, a little bit of a browning. Um, not necessarily like a, a chewing like a caterpillar will start to skeletonize it. And you'll kind of almost, um, almost like a, a leaf scorch. So that's another thing that quite often people say, oh, something's, I must have spider mite because my leaves are starting to turn brown, but it's just, it's, again, you have to get in there. That's when your, your piece of paper, shake it over, get your lens out, actually take a look at, at anything that's falling off the plant. And uh, with, with a lens, you can actually see the egg masses at, and, uh, and the spotted, uh, two spotted spider mite. This is another kind of one that we get a lot of qu uh, questions about, you know, what is this thing? Um, Cedar apple rust on certain junipers. Uh, usually, there's uh, an overwintering host uh, of you know some of the apples and some of the the fruit type woods uh, of wood around in the area, and then it moves on to your cedars and junipers. Um, I'm not going to get a lot in, into you know the the treatment or the pruning or anything. I mean that's it's a quick quick research, and there's you know multi multitude of methods, but it is important that when you are out there on, on properties and you do see some of this uh, that you know you get out your brand new set of Falcos and you do some pruning but after the fact you want to definitely disinfect anytime you're out there pruning even if you don't see um, any sort of diseases and it looks like a healthy plant from property to property or even from from different plant to different plant I'd suggest getting some some rubbing alcohol something in your in your truck in your work box and just disinfe disinfecting all your tools be between each one because you could be at a property that's you know maybe had some some issues and you've even got your gas trimmers out and you're you're you know trimming this beautiful hedge and then you go next door and you're doing the same thing and all of a sudden you know you're spreading that especially if it's it's a little damp and wet Anytime you're working in, in uh, any sort of foliage that's damp and wet, disinfect after the, after the fact. And again, this is kind of carry a, carry a hand lens, a smartphone, and don't bug me. <laughs> so it's, I think one of the main issues, or one of the main questions we get uh, here, and uh, you, you, may, you may get these questions as well, uh, especially with our perennial crops. We have customers come in or send emails, and they inevitably kind of get pushed towards me, and and they ask, you know, are you guys spraying? Are you guys spraying? What are you spraying? Because I don't want to buy crops from you and plant them in my gardens, and then all of a sudden all my pollinators are dead. Well, again, that's kind of you're reading maybe some gardening blog that doesn't have the right information behind it. Um, at least you're asking questions, which is good. You're thinking about it. But uh, we don't use any neonics, uh, any of those chemicals. So you may have heard that on the news that, you know, bees were dying in great numbers. A lot of that has to do with uh, agricultural crops and the treating of uh, seed and pretreatment. And then as the dust, as they're seeding, the dust blows into woodlots. And unfortunately, the, the pollinators pick it up and then... It, and the mortality rate is huge. We pollinators in our production are actually a huge thing. We have a local uh, beekeeper that has hives on uh, one of our main production farms, and we will if we do have to go the chemical route and spray. We don't use any neonics in our in our production and our in our treatments, and we also go and we we look at the treatment time. Um, we w make sure that it's, it's usually in the evening when uh, you can't get any drift from the spray. Usually all the pollinators are at home chilling out uh, after a busy day, flying back and forth to the hive, and they're not going to be out on any of the plants. So 
there's way there's ways to kind of mitigate the damage and, and and you know keep the risk low to your pollinators but to simply say that uh, most farms have to use chemical over over, over the t over the course of the crop and j just to simply say that something was sprayed and now I'm going to plant it in my yard and pollinators are going to die it's it's something that really can't happen in that that direction so again kind of no no harm no foul asking questions but it's to know the science behind it um, I kind of just wanted to give you a high level view I didn't really want to take the entire hour because it's the last presentation of the day I'm actually surprised that any of you stayed for this um, <coughs> I kind of there's yeah well there's prizes and and the happy hour I think is 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 really probably something that's keeping people around so I was going to kind of get this short and sweet, but any questions, any concerns? Yeah. I have one. Sure. See, with, with the nursery crops, we're, uh, I guess, fortunate, if you want to put it for lack of a better word, um, that we are licensed to use specific in insecticides and pesticides um, that are heavily regulated, obviously, where you, you're not eligible to use those out in, in, the, in the, like, commercial kind of uh, gardening aspect. And, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, that's that's knowing the life cycle of your pest. So generally, you need to go get in there and, and either prune or remove egg masses prior to that. You need to see when the adults are flying and see if you can you can uh, mitigate that a little bit. You know, I even say it, I even say it here that sometimes it's just pruning. That that that's the only way. Uh, even even with the gypsy moth uh, egg masses, uh, I think city of Hamilton. Um, said we're not going to do aerial spraying now. I don't know why they chose to go that route. They, they went the, the, the picking of the egg mass and the banding of the trees is the way that they wanted to deal with the infestation compared to other municipalities. So uh, they've weighed the pros and cons. They've looked at it, and sometimes the only method is just literally getting in there by hand and, and clipping and removing. And you can explain to a customer, yeah, the, uh, you know, that this, this is an issue. Again, when we go back to IPM and, and some of the things, you know, maybe if you're noticing that in that particular area, um, it's time to maybe put something in there that isn't going to be susceptible to that. It could be it could be a, a s little microclimate that they love. Uh, I know that viburnum. No, I know that viburnum leaf beetle. That was a huge issue a number of years ago too, and everyone was kind of steering away from from. Uh, in the viburnum bores, uh, kind of viburnum plants, and they were going through. Everything si sort of goes in a cycle. But yeah, any of the leaf rollers and things, we use a systemic um, uh, pesticide. So fortunately, even even though that they're they're closed in in a cocoon, sometimes they start to feed on that, and it's it's the chemical is stored within the plant. So anytime they start to feed, then so you can use systemic just before you start to use that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, it, there's it'll only be in the plant for a certain time, so it's all about kind of the timing. So, so yeah. And I don't, I'm not too sure if there's any biological that I, I'm aware of that, that, can, that will take care of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right, yeah. Sometimes just getting in there and... Yeah, no, no. I, I, I mean, in, in fact, the more you pinch and prune a plant, probably it'll be a little nicer and tighter. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's one of those things where it's unfortunate. Sure, yeah. I, yeah, you know, again, it's kind of a more of an environmental sometimes will help where if you can increase the airflow, if you can thin out your roses, prune them out so that they're a little more open. Make sure that, you know, quite often w if they're up against a foundation and they have that little bit of extra heat, that sometimes helps, but that's... Can I add in there? Yeah. So there's a brand new product came out by Scott. It's called Beat and Be Gone, and it's the BT that they use for the Grub Be Gone. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Incredible powder. So you can now mix this up and spray it. I leave right between the cap and the shooter. I'm taking the shapers. I mean, they're tough, yeah. right? So they're, it's going to work. Just like Grub Be Gone will work on the larval stage of Lone Shapers, the Beetle Be Gone will work on, uh, and that just came out. There's actually some on the shelf over there if you want to uh, Try that check out. it out behind the cafe. Good to know. Right at the back. That's had some residuals, too, because one of the things with the Japanese beetles, all they had was basically insecticidal soaks or pyrethrin yeah. with no residual. This will apparently stay on the leaf like a BT table, but it's a, just a different strand of BT. Nice. You know, and that's a really good point is is to be able to identify what the, the pest is and then getting to know its life cycle because generally any most of these chemicals or, or, or even just a, a physical um, pruning of the plant, it's about interrupting that life cycle to, to slow the population down and get rid of it. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it could be just, again, the choice of, of plants, not the, you know, if you can choose anything else that might not be susceptible to that. Yeah, yeah we do, yeah. Yeah, er, early on, like I usually do two applications for, so when I, when I generally do a first um, fungicide, I'll put in a systemic, and that's usually, because you have to, you have to start looking at your uh, growing degree days, okay, so, yeah. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit after, like leaf, just a, just after the the first kind of leaf is coming out. So, and then the growing degree days is is important to know again what potentially could be hatching and and starting, and then you you kind of work your uh, application around uh, how many heat units there there have been. Yeah. Usually, yeah. usually late May or yeah. after the plants have fully leafed out and just started to form some permanent life. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. You win a prize, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The Arctic wells, and it, will, will the beet? Have you have you noticed that on any of the? Yeah. 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 So yeah, you're uh, again in agriculture, horticulture, and, and ornamental crops. Fortunately, our our repertoire of you know <laughs> chemicals is a little bit more broad than what you guys can use, which is pretty much nothing. Yeah. Back there. Yeah, I, I haven't really done a lot of research or, or looking into that particular one, but like anything, you know, when, once they do some studying and once they know the science behind it, generally if it's coming towards us, if, if it's in Michigan, it, it usually finds its way towards us. That's usually a good indication that their winters are fairly similar to ours and, and what will happen. So, you know, kind of kind of look at some of that research and, and see what they're doing and then eventually, the one thing is this, the CFAA and, and, and uh, you know, they, they try to be proactive on a lot of these issues. And obviously, we don't want invasive species <laughs> jumping the border and, and affecting our woodlands and everything. And unfortunately, it's happened. And we've learned big lessons, especially from the, uh, uh, I, th I would say, emerald ash borer. 
Um, so no, I sorry I can't really speak too clearly on that one. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It, so again, um, just to kind of keep things a little bit shorter, I didn't bother uh, getting too much information up there. But if you go on the Landscape Ontario website, type in uh, box tree moth on their on their search engine, it it will actually give you a step by step how how to how to how to scout for it, what's registered for for treating it, and also uh, the care and and after the damage has happened to to rejuvenate it. So yeah, don't if that's the thing, don't. If you're going in there and it is identified as box tree moth that caused the damage, don't be too ready. If it's an old, really nice hedge, don't be too, like that was in that same year, that picture, don't be too ready just to get in there and yank it out. Um, uh, well, unless the customer wants it yanked out and you're going to be able to plant something else in there, obviously. But, but I mean, it's kind of a win when you go in there and can rejuvenate something. Yeah. I believe CTK is also uh, affected mm -hmm. for And there's a, there's that that picture that was up there. Um, uh, that's generally what the moth will look like, but it, there's almost there's a, a new variant out there that is a little bit more brown than that one. And they they found a few of them. Now whether or not that's even just something else, but they call it they just call it a variant to that. So it has less white on its wings. Yeah. Anybody else about bugs? No? Okay. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone. Do you want to uh, draw another sure, uh, let's number do it. there, Andrew? 35. 35. 